Hello again, everyone. Welcome to the second part of today's panel. So we'll start with a video conference by Meta Heaven and followed by a short Q&A. And then we're going to have our respondent, Marta Perano, and a group debate among all. So I will introduce Daniel, who is here with us, straight from Amsterdam. Meta Heaven is a collective working across design, arts, and filmmaking, founded by Vinka Kruk and Daniel van der Velden. Recent solo presentations include Information Skies, Auto Italia London 2016, The Sprawl at YCBA San Francisco, Black Transparency at Future Gallery Berlin, and Islands in the Cloud at MoMA PS1 New York. Thank you so much, uh, Daniel, for joining us. We hope the gods of internet stay together. Have a nice session. Thank you. Um, thanks so much for uh, showing up. I can see you pretty well. Um, I, can ho I hope you can see me too. The connection doesn't fail us uh, tonight. Uh, I hope you're having a great um, session there. Like, uh, I'm very sorry that Bing Ami cannot be there in person. It has to do with um, basically the reason uh, behind this talk as well. Uh, the talk is called Digital Tarkovsky, and we're currently in the editing phase of a, of a film, and it's quite complex, and we can't leave here, basically. So we're just bound to our um, editing equipment, basically. Um, so I'm going to uh, talk today, um, I'm going to share a screen soon, but I'm going to talk today uh, about digital Tarkovsky. Uh, Tarkovsky, the, the Russian filmmaker, maybe you know him, I hope you do. Uh, and that's also the title of a forthcoming book that we're going to publish uh, soon uh, with Stroka Press uh, in Moscow, actually, very apt. Um, and I'm going to talk you through a bunch of our own obsessions with regard to digital image, moving image, filmmaking, uh, and the and the interface, basically. Um, I see sometimes familiar faces around here, which I'm happy happy about, um, and I miss you guys. So, okay, I'm just going to... Hopefully this will, will go fluidly. Right, so here we go. Um, I, wanna, I would like to start with a poem, actually. Um, something we do recently quite a lot. Um, and the poem, the poem, I think, applies pretty well to Tarkovsky's work uh, and his, um, his method. Um, the poem is by Marina Tsekaeva, a Russian poet, and um, it's called The Poet goes like this. A poet's speech begins a great way off. A poet is carried far away by speech, by way of planets, signs, and the ruts of roundabout parables between yes and no. In his hands, even sweeping gestures from a bell tower become hook-like, for the way of comets is the poet's way. And then the blown apart links of causality are his links. Look up after him without hope. The eclipses of poets are not foretold in the calendar. Here's the one that mixes up the cards and confuses arithmetic and weight. Demands answers from the school bench, the one who altogether refutes Kant, the one in the stone graves of the Bastille, who remains like a tree in its loveliness, and yet the one whose traces have always vanished. The train everyone always arrives too late to catch. For the path of comets is the path of poets. They burn without warning, pick without cultivating. They are an explosion, a breaking in, and the main of their path makes the curve of a graph cannot be foretold by the calendar. So our own uh, relationship with uh, with um, with filmmaking started uh, when we uh, began to make films. Uh, basically, 2013, we started to make uh, videos that were pretty much collage of found footage and pretty much sort of video essays. Um, and uh, then we started making music videos uh, with Holly Herndon in 2014 and 2015. And in 2015, we also started to work on our first long film, longer film, the sprawl propaganda about propaganda. Uh, and one thing that um, uh, I, this is not going to be sort of a portfolio presentation of sorts, but I just want to introduce basically how we started working on film. So we come from a graphic design background originally, 
uh, and this means this has a great influence on the way that we approach um, making moving image because we do not never see the moving image in itself as it's recorded by a camera and it's then you know displayed we don't quite see that as complete we always are interested in what um, for example moving image and interface mean together what they can be together since so much of the um, our visual reality online and also in on the computer simply in the tools we work with and the media we surround ourselves with is uh, interfaced so we are interested in what um, moving image and interface mean can mean together so the film uh, the sprawl uh, which uh, was released in 2016 exists in three different ways it exists uh, as a website a web platform which is itself a mask for a, a youtube channel basically uh, where all those videos are playable but they're also overlaid with other graphics etc um, and uh, the, the tagline for that film was uh, in 2014 a strange set of event unfolds events unfolds um, without apparent plan or structure they seem connected uh, we no longer see the internet as a means of communication but as a way to change the nature of reality itself uh, so there's these sort of um, um, kind of world of overlays and the, the film itself is a very manic film about propaganda uh, and rather than um, dissecting how propaganda works um, the film has a way of positioning itself as a propagandistic uh, message in a sense so it, it doesn't quite expose um, and make transparent or address or call to justice the way that we uh, that messages are manipulated and various um, propaganda brings about a certain emotional state uh, in us, but it, it really it shows it, but it also goes, it, it creates, it goes with it, so it assumes its form in a sense. Um, and one topic that was very strong in the in the sprawl, uh, propaganda about propaganda, was the, um, the, 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 the war in Ukraine, that was a strong topic in that film. Uh, and it was connected to a bunch of other things and we were interested in explaining the logic of these uh, events uh, and their lure, uh, propagandistically speaking, uh, through, a, through two directions. One direction was really a more philosophical and poetic direction, which uh, here is exemplified by this still uh, from the sprawl uh, where uh, we, he, we listen to, we, we see a piece by Tolstoy on art um and in this piece tolstoy explains that uh, art uh, is the transfer the transmission of an emotion from um, a speaker or, or or sender to a recipient and in order to uh, be art the, the emotion has to be felt the same way as it was transmitted by the by the recipient so that's that's the idea about that he has about art but in order for that to happen it's not necessary that the the experience that is being narrated actually did happen. So it actually is possible to transmit something that was invented um, rather than something that was experienced. And the other, um, the other angle that we use in this film is that of um, what Benjamin Bratton, uh, design philosopher, calls uh, planetary scale computation, a phenomenon that he has addressed in a, a series of works, uh, research works, and he's also being interviewed in the film. He calls it the stack, and it's basically his way of explaining a kind of mega structure, as he calls it, of planetary scale computation that overlays most events um, that happen on Earth and that actually creates the possibility for multiple truth claims uh, or sovereignty claims even happening on the same events and and places uh, in networks so it's a it's a it's um it's a theory that doesn't necessarily address propaganda directly but that applies to it a great deal so that was the topic of the sprawl which was released as a feature film it was released as his website and it was also created in the form of a five screen multi-channel insulate film installation which is actually our favorite our favorite version of the work uh and 
that was our first real encounter with longer film. Uh, one shot in the scroll is this one. This is the image capture board, uh, sort of chip, the image chip of a Blackmagic uh, film camera, actually the one that was used to, uh, to, to film the sprawl. Um, so we're very interested in the combinations between software and hardware that are, that are at work in um, contemporary image. So, so on the one hand, in filmmaking, there is a great um, tendency to stick to certain rules and to stick to certain quality standards, uh, to work with large crews, to work with um, uh, certain equipment that's very expensive to buy or to rent, etc. And on the other hand, there is a certain uh, democratization of that um, of that same type of image, this type of image that's produced by cinema by the release of cheaper cameras like the Black Magic. So this may sound like a technical detail that's uninteresting, but actually Black Magic as a company emerged out of a Australian uh, company that digitized celluloid film. So basically this whole technology of these cheaper um, cinema cameras that Black Magic are have been, have emerged out of um, digi the digitization business, so to speak. So the second film we did was in, uh, another film, basically the sequel to uh, to to the sprawl propaganda about propaganda was a film in 2016, uh, um, <clears throat> Information Skies, uh, which is a fiction piece, uh, sometimes with the, with the same actors as uh, that's the sprawl, but it's a purely it's a it's a fiction piece, and uh, in this film, but also in the sprawl, I guess you can see some uh, definitely some influences of uh, Andrei Tarkovsky uh, in the approach. Um, long takes, uh, duration is very long, and the kind of there's a sort of um, um, enigmatic quality to it. I guess it's hard to say that about your own work, um, also, of course, because you also looked at it for so long and so often. So it's 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 not enigmatic enough uh, anymore. That same way for us, but it's it definitely can be for viewers. Uh, it also has uh, animation parts, and it was a film that was released um, together with the Gwangju Biennale in Korea. So, and, and Margarita um, was one of the curators there. So, we're very thankful for that collaboration. Uh, and it was, and we're really, um, actually, Paul Verhoeven, the Dutch director, said something really good recently. He said, actually, the reason to make films is not for them to be successful. You make a film so that you can make a next film, and that's exactly how we feel about filmmaking um, coming from a other background than than filmmaking originally uh, so also we have create we have already we are already recording a sequel to uh, shooting a sequel to, to information skies and in our in our um, sort of interest in in uh, interface we're also very interested in subtitles so for us for example subtitles are not something that's just added to an image it's something that's really part of the image and that should be treated as a cinematic rather than just a practical add-on to 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 the image uh but um yeah i guess we'll talk more about that the, the whole interface stuff in a bit so these are still this is one particularly um current or topical sentence from uh, information skies Suicide bombers are also people. And then uh, now we have, uh, this is a film we're currently editing. It's a film called Possessed. Uh, and it's a, probably our longest film uh, so far. And it was shot in Croatia. And here are just some uh, real quick, I hope you can see it. I'm just going to check real quick. Yeah, I can still see you and I can still see what's, what you see. But these are some stills from that film. Um, which we're currently editing, which will not come out um, until in a while. So it's not unthinkable that we have released something else before this film come out, comes out. Just to say that the whole approach also has uh, emphasis on um, durational motives and on stuff that's both related to interfaces and to um, let's say to nature as well and to airports it was shot at a former military airport in in croatia anyway so now you have hopefully a sort of update a quick visual update of what we are we've been doing 
uh, here in the past um, two years, uh, apart from doing also all kinds of other work, uh, shows, artworks, um, design work, website, web design, writing, etc. It's the stuff, all the stuff we love to do. Um, and now I want to get to the uh, to the real to the real sort of um, substance of the of the talk. I'm just going to quick quickly check out of the so you can see me. Hi, you're still there. Good. <laughs> I'm going to go. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to go back to the to the to the slides now. Um, yeah. Right. So. In 2014, for one reason or another, I had almost no money in my bank account and regularly bought things like cheap white loaves of bread and cheap cheese at the Dirk supermarket in Amsterdam North. I'm not sure if you're familiar with Amsterdam, but this is really a kind of like low end supermarket where I went all the time. Um, and as part of this phase, I also began to feel an attachment to YouTube, the Google owned video platform, uh, which exists since 2005. Uh, and this is a list of the most popular videos on YouTube. Um, still headed firmly by the Korean um, Gangnam Style video uh, with uh, almost 3 uh, billion views um, as of now or as of now-ish. So for a sort of lack of resources to buy books or purchase records or movie tickets, I got for some time quite some of my information, lectures, music and film experiences ex exclusively from YouTube. And I'm, I'm, I'm exaggerating this now, but for, just picture it. YouTube is like the internet's equivalent of IKEA furniture. It isn't even noteworthy at all, and precisely for that reason, essential. YouTube, disguised as a mere facilitator of moving image, is almost always hiding in plain sight, while media and people talk about things like Facebook, Snapchat, Instagram, Uber, self-driving cars, etc., Airbnb, to name but a few, few scarcely systematized subjects around platforms, computation, and automation. But at the same time, YouTube is the third most viewed website in the world. The total number of people who use YouTube is 1.3 million, a billion, pardon me, and 300 hours of video are uploaded to YouTube every minute. Almost 5 billion videos are watched on YouTube every single day. So that's quite substantial, and uh, I, I'd say that um, um, there is something about YouTube that is um, of relevance to our topic here today. Um, uh, there is YouTube, lots of work scholarship on YouTube. There's lots of scholarship on the way that uh, what YouTube, uh, the role YouTube played in citizen journalism and the advent of the Arab Spring and things like that. That's not the primary concern of this talk, though. But it's uh, it's um, um, it's interesting. It's important. So, for lack of money to buy books or purchase records or movie tickets, I got for some time quite some of my information, lectures, music, and film experiences exclusively from the platform, YouTube. And the platform's way of suggesting and then auto-playing sub sub subsequent videos as it has a tendency of pulling you further down the rabbit hole. Uh, meaning whatever thing you were interested in gets kind of enlarged by the next video, the next video, the next video. Um, for example, a, if you would take the example of a so critical documentary about Russia, for example, that would autoplay to an interview with, with the country's president, Vladimir Putin, which will then autoplay to a broadcast by RT, Kremlin-owned television channel, and that may well end up autoplaying to the victory parade on May 9 in Moscow, where, where the Russian army holds its annual showcase of weaponry. And in turn, further down that rabbit hole, there may be smartphone shot tank battles in eastern Ukraine or 4K footage from a Russian drone in Syria. And that might again lead you further down other rabbit holes until you have become, let's say, fully um, primed by, for the subject. So the YouTube and thus Google algorithm serves you with more of what it thinks you like. Hiding in plain sight within that assumed preference is the potential for a kind of tunnel vision, obviously, in which the YouTube hobbyist becomes tied up in an ever tighter set of ideas and beliefs encased in the sequential order and durational addictiveness of the videos themselves. Um, and it was actually, um, there's something about that topic of binge watching that's interesting. Um, and it was, it's not something that we've researched deeply 
but there it was, uh, of course, uh, Snowden, Edward Snowden, who in, uh, in his first interview with The Guardian in 2013 hinted at this um, role that perhaps platforms like Netflix and HBO play in, in a kind of ideological apparatus, if, if so to speak, if you allow me this little um, side route. Um, so he, he, of course, he's in uh, asylum in Russia. And he, he described, uh, after he blew the whistle on his employers, um, the NSA's massive surveillance programs, he described the life of an NSA specialist. And he said, quote, living on freely, but comfortably, you can collect your large paycheck for relatively little work against the public interest, comma, and go to sleep at night after watching your shows. But then if you realize that that's the world that you help create. Um, so, he mentions the shows and I, I just felt like this is basically, it's not YouTube, but it's binge watching and the role that this kind of binge watching at night plays in lives, like, and how it sort of puts people to, I don't know, why, the, just the role that it plays in maintaining a certain ideological structure. That's something that's vaguely interesting. Anyway, so whilst eating some of that white bread that I said, you know, in Amsterdam North, I discovered that most film, uh, Soviet era and still active Moscow based film producer has put on YouTube much of the work of the revered film author Andrei Tarkovsky. So, um, actually, they put all his films there in full HD and with subtitles and everything. So, basically, this is a very interesting approach to copyright, a very interesting approach to digital rights, and a very, very interesting approach to, to, to distribution. So, Tarkovsky's films are known for their extraordinary length, slow progress, and deep poetic and artistic symbolism. Admittedly, these are not qualities that are presupposed to be liked on the internet, of course. In fact, Tarkovsky's films at first glance uh, seem diametrically opposed to the mimetic fast food and viral tunnel vision that characterize YouTube, where still Gangnam Style is the most watched uh, video. Um, but there's something about uh, Tarkovsky that sticks when we think about internet age and when we think about uh, what what's so particular for you know today's experience platforms etc. Maybe maybe that element is first of all duration itself, simply the, simply the longevity of um, of of the of of the films. And this is also the meme that has arisen about Tarkovsky. Uh, so there is a, a, send, a set of Tarkovsky memes online. Um, like this one, not sure if Tarkovsky film froze or if I need to appreciate his artistic, this artistic scenery. Uh, and generally, lots of memes that to do with slowness and longevity. Uh, um, um, and so there, there is a way in which people that have never actually watched a, a Tarkovsky film right until the end still think that they know what it is about because they know the black box of the work, which is that it's long difficult, poetic, etc. It just takes a long time, technically, like in the sort of technical sense. Um, and of course, that's not a quality that's presupposed to be liked on, you know, in a digital environment, but it's, it's a quality that you can package in a sense, in a, in a digital environment and, and, and make jokes about. And I think that what we're, what we're interested in with regard to Tarkovsky is not just, uh, of course, uh, his films, obviously, and the way that he worked, the way that he wrote scripts, the way that he conceived of images, all that is really, really interesting, especially uh, when you take into account that it was quite a messy process. So he was not this orderly planning uh, master genius. He was not, which is very encouraging for artists, uh, that he was not this sort of clear cut guy who knew exactly what he wanted all the time and he just did it he knew what he wanted but he was approached a lot of his work pretty pretty much like a sketchbook and that's pretty pretty um pretty evident when you look at um his scripts his notes etc and there is another aspect to this durational um uh, element to to the durational element that tarkovsky brings to the fore which has a more political or strategic uh, or trickier side as well, which we would like to um, kind of summarize as timeline occupation. And that sounds more negative 
uh, then it's meant. It's not meant as something negative. It's just something that we think or that that we can surmise. You know, happens a lot in in environments where platforms, digital technology sort of plays a role. So the the British uh, thinker um, uh, Will Self, he asserted recently that films are over. They're done with. They're a thing of the past. And when he said that, the audience was laughing. But is there actually any substance to that claim? You know, because if you think about film a little bit more widely than only in terms of like stuff that that humans do, uh, you can think that uh, about film as something that things do as well. You know, we and our electronic things produce more duration than ever. Um, Cameras are everywhere. They are carried everywhere and they are built inside everything and they're mounted on anything. Everything gets weaponized with vision nowadays. So things become points of view. Objects become their own directors of photography. Today it's easier to produce moving image than it is not to. Also for things. So you can say that whilst, you know, maybe film as a paradigm, you know, you can talk about that for a real long time, but the, the, the very, the very production of high resolution duration, visual, visual material that has duration is something that's no longer just in our hands. It's in the hands of our things. It's in the hands of machines and it keeps on going and going, but we don't have a, um, well, we certainly don't have a theory for it, but we don't even have a practical model for just how to interpret, how to look at this type of, you know, imagery. Uh, and, um, you know, Harun Faroqi, the, the, the filmmaker, called that images that were produced by machines, he called them operational images. Um, and, of course, CCTV, drones, dash cams, satellites, medical equipment, all these things are producing um, duration, in a sense. So there, there's a way in which we can look at duration in this sort of um, um, you know, film that ha doesn't have viewers, but that, that has to be, that has to basically, that is, that is asking, begging for reinvention of what it is to watch film. Uh, this is some, one concern in this term that we, we want to put, put on the agenda, cinema for the interface. But the other side to this is the notion of the time that you actually do spend with forms of duration. And that doesn't need to necessarily need to be a film, but it can be anything that occupies your time uh, in a platform. Uh, and I think what comes very clear with, um, um, <clears throat> you know, the, 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 the eruption or, or the, the invention of terms like post fact and, and fake news, and alternative facts and things like that, and you know the whole notion of the of the current U.S. president uh, and how he commands new cycles is that you have a form of timeline occupation. You have a form of um, way in which you are spending time with this material, and this time, you know, the platform can transmit the same duration um, in a thousand, million, billion-fold ways without ever getting tired. But you. When you spend time with this, you can only spend that time once. So time that you actually spend with something is, some, is always time that you can't spend on anything on, on something else. And that sounds like a real, like a kind of like um, a trivial, and it is, but it's also not because the there's a there's a there's a sort of strategic uh, and tactical side to this, which which has to do with propaganda, which has to do with psychological, the psychology of duration. Um, I'm not saying that's the very same duration that's at work in Tarkovsky necessarily, but there are there are ways in which we can grasp the topic of duration simply in this way. So there's two things here. There's duration and epistemology, uh, the formation of knowledge, uh, and there is duration as waiting, simply, plainly waiting. Mm. So there is... Um, and we're interested in the appreciation of this uh, concept through the work of um, contemporary philosopher Brian Sumi, who, um, who tries to understand what he calls the culture of insecurity that permeates our contemporary new liberal condition uh, by examining the logic of preemption. Uh, and preemption is understood as power refocused 
on what may emerge instead of on what simply is. Uh, and in this, in order for this type of power to be active, Masumi claims, it must be constantly aware. And uh, through the through this state of awareness, the state of perception, attention itself is becoming the object of politics. Uh, maybe it always was that, but it's just a way of saying it in a sort of new way. And um, what he what he's interested in is preemption as it developed as a paradigm during the war on terror, basically post two thousand post nine eleven. Uh, neoconservative thinking around how how we have to basically act on stuff that isn't even there, um, and he took this uh, this these doctrines a bit more seriously than most of us do in a way, which produced a book onto power. Just a look at um, some of the things he said in in there to just understand this whole notion of duration a little bit better. So what we're trying to get at with this notion of timeline occupation is to develop an understanding of what it is, is what forces the timeline. Um, so if platforms have a way of dealing with uh, um, humans through duration, dragging people back into platforms, not letting them leave, basically leave, basically uh, obfuscate the open internet in favor of just spending time on one platform, Facebook is the the most famous example of that. Um, so it's time that can only be spent once and it will never return for users. And in reverse, we can see that whoever uh, owns your time, owns your interactions, owns your, um, also your mindset in a sense for your next action. And it seems there that the, that the notions of um, power that are developed by Masumi are very interesting and relevant. Um, so time spent with media, for example, with online videos or whatever, or with interacting with others on, on social networks, etc., is an absolute loss of time that you could have spent elsewhere. Uh, and so in that sense, every platform is can be in a, seen as an adversary. Uh, hence also the worries about children that spend their entire youth in Minecraft. Hence the worries about smartphone addiction and other forms of platform-led timeline occupation, which are non-military, non, 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 not concerned with violence, but that do ne nevertheless enact a form of structural violence, you could say, on, on subjects. Hence also worries about propaganda and fake news. It's not just the fake news, it's the time that it takes to weed out that it's fake news. It's the fact that in order to designate something as fake news, you still you first have to repeat the thing that is fake news. So it's the whole timeline stuff that comes with it that actually makes this stuff effective. And we can see that already with the uh, with the birther, the, the the birth certificate meme that the Tea Party uh, and Donald Trump himself launched around Barack Obama. You know uh, that very meme required the refu its own refutation. Uh, it, uh, it went to refute it. You had to repeat it, which is basically. Um, so, Germany's concept of power may become useful to us, bearing in mind that the views uh, that his views of perpetual war are being brought about by this war on terror um, uh, scope, which of course at some point needs to be abandoned as well. So, the two things that bother Masumi are perception and attention. And as a recognition and subsequent action against threats depends first on our ability to perceive them. So perception, that gets entwined with attention, our ability to focus on particular things within the perceptual field. So attention, says Masumi, is the base state habit of perception. Every awareness begins in a shift. We think of ourselves as directing the shift in our attention, but if you pay attention to paying attention, you quickly sense that your attention is directing you. Attention is the perceptual automatism that consists in tagging a change in the perceptual field as new and potentially important and building awareness on that change. So he then goes to on to identify the shifting logic between the uses of hard power in a conflict, which he calls force on force, versus the deployment of what he calls soft power, which in this context he understands as something like psychological warfare, non-kinetic operations that work at the perceptual base state and awareness of the opponent. Uh, and this type of uh, operation can be called epistemological, um, 
because, quote, its business is what people know or think they know. Now, of course, epistemological warfare is nothing new, but the paradigm has significantly shifted. Traditionally, what is now called soft power was a helper to hard power. It was secondary to force on force, whose effectiveness it was meant to boost. It was an, addict, an additive. And now, on the other hand, all conflict is by nature epistemological. Soft power, rather than an additive or booster, is a baseline state. War is no longer punctual, like a battle. It is now on low boil all the time. It is no longer localized, like an occupation. The heat is everywhere. So it is actually a sort of occupation, but more in a sort of temporal sense than in a sense of place. So he, he claims that the idea of conflict as a punctual engagement of force on force has been replaced by waiting. That's something that um, Paul Virilio called the non-battle. But in the condition of non-battle, wait, in the condition of non-battle, when you have nothing on which to act tangibly, there is still one thing you can do to act on that condition, act to change the conditions in which you wait. After all, it is from these same conditions that any action to come will have emerged. Um, so contemporary war is epistemological, but it is a mistake to take too cognitive an approach. The move into perception is accompanied in the contemporary theater of war with a correlative move towards the approach that was touted by Donald Rumsfeld and his fellow neocons. In this approach, you move into perception in order to operate not on the level at which actions are deliberatively decided, but at the level at which the very capacity for action is forming. Operating at the level at which the capacity for action is in the making is a very different proposition than focusing on purely cognitive aspects of decision making. It focuses on a pre-decision process occurring in an interval of emergence antecedents to both informed knowing and deliberative action. So since, uh, you know, media, platform media uh, own so much of our time right now, aren't they effectively doing the same thing that Masumi describes here, operating at the level in which our capacity for action is in the making? Um, yeah, so, so, yeah, so all kinds of emotional states that we go through whilst we so watch whatever Instagram stories or things like that, uh, forms of, you know, um, experience sharing or forms of moving image that are simply out there. Uh, all this occupied our timeline. And this may provide another angle why YouTube videos, have, you know, with their scaling, the scaling power that they have, uh, online videos have such a strong role in what they, in, in uh, propaganda, you know, because they have duration. And especially if you add, if, if you add all the views and all the ways in which this sort of, you know, results in a sort of timeline occupation. There's a purely, a purely physical sense in which a temporality and duration are, can, can be seen as forms of psychological warfare or propaganda. So that, that's tied to the specter of computation, to the stack, to um, notions of the way in which we are, uh, um, uh, in which computation con contributes and the way it changes, you know, the, the, our society or the way we, we, we operate politically. Uh, and on the other side of that notion of duration, as we first introduced it by, you know, simply thinking about <coughs> Tarkovsky, by thinking about what um, Slavoj Žižek called um, the drabness of time, Žižek, um, in the Pervert's Guide to Cinema, the philosopher uh, Zizek discussed Stalker, uh, one of Tarkovsky's films, and he, he talked about that the film, film's power lies in, quote, a material element of pre-narrative density, time itself. We are made to feel the inertia, the drabness of time. We could also say the non-battle. We could say this is exactly that sort of slowness, that sort of drabness, the sort of, sort of non-action, the, the absence of kinetic of movement in which we are starting to think, in which we are starting to feel about how slow things go, and there we become sort of we become sort of caught in this uh, notion of uh, we become susceptible to what you know, might happen next in our um, perceptual field. Uh, as Zizek says, the uh, the drabness of time, the disintegration of the very material texture of reality, 
which, according to him, provides, provided the film with its spiritual depth. Um, so we can talk about this also as a methodology that, uh, that, that, uh, that um, um, Tarkovsky had uh, in relation to cinema for the interface. And in order to look, I mean, there's a, there's a whole bunch of things to say about this, but in order to look at one particular <clears throat> strategy that, that Tarkovsky used uh, in his work, which is basically the kind of like absence of um, physically very exciting things and the absence of events, I think it's interesting to look at another poem where the same technique basically is used. And it's a poem called Soft Evidence by Ariel Dorfman um, from 1988. And this poem comes from a collection of um, poetry that was initially collected by Amnesty International it was produced under the dictatorship in Chile, uh, the dictatorship of Pinochet, which lasted from 1973 until 1990. And Dorfman, um, who's a celebrated poet, was one of the critical voices during the regime, but he wrote this from outside of Chile. But still, let's look at the poem and then see what, what, what technically we can um, make of this. Soft evidence. <clears throat> if he were dead, I'd know it. Don't ask me how I know. I had no proof, no clues, no answer, nothing that proves or disproves. Here's the sky, the same blue it always was, but that's no proof. Atrocities go on and the sky never changes. There are the children, they're finished playing. Now they'll start to drink like a herd of wild horses. Tonight they'll be asleep as soon as their heads touch the pillow. But who would accept that as proof that our father is not dead? The madness goes on and children are always children. Well, there's a bird, the kind that stops in mid-flight, just wings in the air and almost no body, and it comes every day at the same time to the same flower, just like before. That doesn't prove anything either. Everything's the same as it was the day they took him away. As if nothing had happened and we were just waiting for him to come home from work. No sign, no clue, nothing that proves or disproves. But if he were dead, I know it. It's as simple as that. Don't ask me how. If you were not alive, I'd know it. So, so there is there is something quite evocative um, about this poem. You know, it has this unbearable pain of the unchallenged injustice and missing one's abducted loved one, but also there's this remarkable tactic of reversing, playing with the burden of proof in relation to that loved one's unknowable fate in a continuing normality. So there's something about um, um, uh, about, let's say, Stalker as a film, but also lots of other work by Tarkovsky where the very absence of things that have changed or that, that, so the absence of, let's say, conventional science fiction techniques that usually are supposed to demonstrate that we live in a hypothetical or that we live in the future, etc. cetera, he leaves those things out. And similarly here in this poem, you know, we can see that uh, the, the, the return, the, the continuation of life as normal with the birds, with, with the children, et cetera, is seen, can be is interpreted and used as a way to activate the trauma. So this is basically full-on cinematic technique that he's, that he's using uh, in, in this poem. And I think it's a very important technique with regard to um, techno-futurism, you know, where we are looking at, basically when you're trying to portray technology, when you're we're trying to show technology, uh, visually, uh, it will outdate really quickly. So there is something about technology that doesn't really work with um, a certain depth of storytelling or spirit, you know. And I think that that uh, that um, that he had a, Tarkovsky. Uh, this poem, before we get to Tarkovsky, uh, uh, Dorfman has a, has a very interesting way of activating the trauma by pointing at something like a continuing normality. Um, similarly, one is reminded of um, Trace Evidence, a film by Susan Shupley, in which geological and ephemeral phenomena are forensically traced and re researched and acknowledged for 
sometimes human rights violations, but also for ecological disasters, such as the Chernobyl nuclear power plant meltdown in 1986, which in parlance of the Soviet press office could be classified only as an incident. And indeed, the event went unreported at first. Nuclear particles that were spread in western direction due to strong winds first showed up in the self-monitoring gear of a Swedish nuclear facility, which shut itself down as a consequence of measuring a leak. A leak that wasn't a leak in that facility, but the particles that had traveled to Sweden from the Ukrainian SSR. SSR. So that's alerted um, the, the West to the disaster. And in Shukli's instantiation of soft evidence, the sky becomes the carrier of the burden of forensic proof. So she's really looking at ways in which invisible traces are, are carrying proof. So it's interesting to consider this as a this notion of sometimes you could even call it non-evidence or soft evidence as in relation to, um, for example, stalker. And post hoc, of course, the film has often been identified with the Chernobyl disaster, uh, post, most actively through a 2007 a first-person shooter game, Stalker in the Shadow of Chernobyl, in which motives from the film were adopted and changed to befit an aesthetic featuring many of the defining characteristics of what Anastasia Fedorova and others at the Calvert Journal have identified as the New East. So there's this sort of dystopian, this is actually literally uh, from the film, but there's this kind of like dystopian um, aesthetic which now also has become a very strong music fashion and music video phenomenon, um, which which has this sort of reoccupation of the of the post-Soviet space by kind of like Russian hipsters, basically. But the, the, this is the way that Stalker also got repopularized. This is kind of dystopian aesthetic. And this is this the same aesthetic. Uh, recently in Moscow, uh, more a sort of hipster phenomenon. <clears throat> but if you if you look at uh, Stoker as a, uh, the original for Stoker was a novel, obviously, it was called um, uh, Roadside Picnic and written by the brother Strugatsky, Boris and Arkady Strugatsky, and they wrote the, they wrote the novel uh, Roadside Picnic uh, in 1970 uh, before, nine years before the film was made, and they wrote uh, about these zones, you know, the zones were, were places where aliens had visited Earth, and they would they would be these sort of strange worlds where only so, yeah hi okay okay um, that's great I have actually much more but it's fine we'll see where we we end up I think we'll end up in a good place. Um, so the, um, um, they wrote, you know, they, they, they wrote about these zones, you know, and the classical approach would, of course, have been to, to make these really, really overtly about um, aliens. You know, when you look at Alien, um, Ridley Scott, you know, you know what aliens look like there. But they, they wrote something else about um, the zone. They wrote, if you take a quick look at it, everything seems okay. Uh, wait. We have it. Okay, I lost that quote. No, I did not. Here we are. If you take a quick look at it, everything seems okay. The sun shines there just like it's supposed to, and it seems as if nothing's changed. Everything's the same as 13 years ago. So this is almost the same as uh, soft evidence. Um, and actually, it's interesting that this is the way they they delivered a kind of directive for sci-fi or for maybe how to how we can deal with technology or with notions of technology in a kind of more interesting way. But uh, Tarkovsky had the idea that it was his invention. So uh, Tarkovsky wrote, "I was no more interested, therefore, in the fantastic plot of Stalker than I had been in the storyline of Solaris. Unfortunately, the science fiction element in Solaris was nonetheless too prominent." and became a distraction. The rockets and space stations required by Lem's novel were interesting to construct, but it seems to me now that the idea of the film would have stood out more vividly and boldly had we managed to dispense with these things altogether. And then, after a while, he writes, in Stalker, only the basic situation could strictly be called fantastic. So, so I just want to just highlight the, the, the very way in which casting a sort of basic spell over reality 
is is much more is much stronger cinematic uh, uh, technique in a way than specifying technology uh, in the image in a way. And I, I think this has um, there is an afterlife for that on the internet. And there's tons to say about that in the way in which duration of film has been since internet has sort of taken us away from the television. It has also taken us away from the walls of television, basically meaning that um, duration is, is there is again a possibility in film also on, on the internet. It's one thing that the, the essay will argue. I had a, a long uh, piece about uh, a Russian pop group Tattoo, but I'm not gonna go in there. Um, I'm going to simply end with something that demonstrates um, Tarkovsky's screenwriting uh, practices in an interesting way. So the, the final scene of Stalker, there is Monkey, the daughter who is disabled, she can't walk because she's born in the zone, so she has the disability. And um, in the original script, shooting script, Tarkovsky, because in the zone where you go in Tarkovsky, there's this room in there where your innermost wish will be granted. And with his original script for the ending of Stalker, where she reads a poem and then reads it to us after she closed the book, uh, he had a very, uh, he had a very, had the idea that he wanted to visualize her innermost desire of this young girl. And it was, and I want pastries too, chocolate buns with syrup and smoked eels and everything that's got a scent. Flowers, nice perfume, mushroom soup smells nice, and also a silk dress, which rustles when you stroke it. And also my innermost wishes for a fur muff, soft and warm, fluffy and smooth. Beautiful and very sensual but, and very tactile, but he ended with something else. In the end, she reads this poem by Fyodor Chuchev, I love your dear eyes. I love your eyes, my darling friend, their play so passionate and brightening, when a sudden stare up you send, and I, like a heaven-blown lightning, I take in all from end to end. But there's more that I admire. Your eyes, when they're downcast, in bursts of love-inspired fire, and through the eyelash goes fast a somber, dull cast of desire. That's how we chose to end Solker. And it's pretty telling of the way he worked, the way Tarkovsky worked, where he always changed his ideas. It was it was a bit messy, etc. It was just like uh, you and I, basically. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Daniel. I, I'm sitting on the left corner, and I'll be moderating a short Q and A. Uh, I'll mm. open straight to the public if there are some questions. If not, I would have a tiny comment. Some curious thoughts? Provocations? Don't be shy. Well. Yeah, it's <laughs> I have a lot of questions myself, obviously, but that's... that's um, <laughs> That's because we're still working on this thing, so it's something that uh, that we we're we're will be done soon. But well, it was very nice that you approached the question of uh, duration and time because over these days we've been talking about the um, the form of how it's so easy to represent space, but all the time dimension seems to be a bit on the side. And talking about mm -hmm. this uh, navigation of soft and hard powers and how they're pervading through our lives. Uh, yeah. It's interesting that you bring back Masumi that we were just approaching this morning's workshop with Jean. And um, also that you're working for the interface and thinking on these durational conditions of, of narrative for its specific uh, you know, dimension of absorption and uh, for its uh, specific technologies of attention. Because mm -hmm. I always think about interface usage memories and how uh, we sometimes neglect the potential and the unknowability unknow of uh, these repercussions of you know so much interface uses, um, yeah, how how it can like rewire our brains and reconnect and make very specific new uh, detours and how we should be yeah. conscious of either uh, exploring it through technologies of the self, uh, like you know meditation or other kind of self awareness techniques that create this 
uh, other rates of attention for reality and how we need to be a bit more conscious of um, an awareness for new synaptic responses that in the case of Masumi coming through his critique of uh, the politics, for example, of fear and terrorism, when he approaches us as like neuronal distributed systems that are mm -hmm. modulated through these gaps, through exactly yeah. these known times, these durational moments that they are so effective and that they are uh, circulating as power for capital and for intervention. So yeah, this is more like uh, a blob of ideas, but maybe you can react to it and we wait for a question from our audience. Well, I, I think like in terms of how we approach this, it, we're not theoreticians. So we're, we're really approaching it from um, a kind of like uh, practice based. Uh, I, I don't want to reduce, you know, this to a purely pragmatic uh, point of view, but it's definitely um, we feel that there's a, an enormous overload of work on technological conditions. Uh, and there's relatively little work being done that tries to form, reformulate those very things into things that we can grasp in a different sense. So we feel that there's an overload of terminologies used right now with regard to um, digital and technological realities, as if these realities are the only realities and if these realities can only be discussed in certain ways. And in, in this, this sense, the, the academic vocabulary is not the only vocabulary in which we can talk about these changes. And I think it's very, for us, it's very important to talk about the change, the fundamental changes that we're undergoing, that we're feeling, that we're, we're feeling in our lives, that we're feeling in places that we live in or visit, et cetera, that we see as very thorough disruptions to, of, um, of notions of time and place and identity and self and other, et cetera, on different terms. And this is where fundamentally for, for me, um, Tarkovsky comes in. He is someone who provides a vocabulary, although he worked in a pre-internet and a pre-network and a pre-platform age, uh, purely technically, there is some, some, somewhat of a way of, of using different vocabularies here. And I think that um, Masumi's, uh, I'm always a little bit with Masumi's work. I'm, I'm, I love it and it's really, it's amazing, but it's also, clashes against this poetic poetic world that we're also really interested in. So it's still, um, um, like for example, uh, like this is a side to side track, but a term like fake news or post-truth, you know, the very term post-truth, that shows how poor, you know, the vocabulary is that we're using to deal with these changes and shifts as if the, the news that we got before there was post-fact was real and true and everything it's just so naive so we need to um i feel we need to come up with more ref refined vocabularies to deal with our emo emotional state also in this type of sort of really twisted and si uh, sort of uh, uh um kind of like sick uh digital world you know like so so that's basically our perspective our perspective is that we are interested in these contradictions but we want to sort of I don't know, give them a different texture in a way. So that's more me as a, as a practitioner maker than as a theoretician, because basically we, we, we are not, we cannot produce a hardcore like theory about these things where everything is allocated. That's definitely something that people like Benjamin can do, Benjamin Braxton do and others, but that's not our, let's of say course. our strength. You know, I think the, the I don't mean to, to sort of just, uh, duck the question with that answer but it's, it's just not even a question like it was more like a reaction i certainly think that the figure of the poet is crucial to learn from evermore these days but we have a question across the room too so let's gather the three questions together and then he answers together okay so yeah. like press the microphone hello hey. um about, about, uh, Quickly about, quickly about post-truth, what makes the post-truth post-truth is not that what we got before post-truth was not, was truth, is that what we call post-truth is aware of its own fakeness and it kind of celebrates it almost, right? Whereas the, the pre-post-truth post-truth we got had the claim to being truthful and it was not truthful. So the post-truth is kind of like, a, a, an example of it is like, it's a, it's a post about the news saying like, Oxford University called uh, 
Hillary Clinton, like a psychopath. And then he just like talks about like this this study that from Oxford that says like Hillary Clinton is a psychopath, but then there's no link and it's very generalized. And when you actually look at the look at the look at the news of it, you realize that the, the research was done years ago and it looked at all politicians and one of them was Hillary Clinton, right? So so that's what dif differentiate post-truth as like the the, the nor normal post-truth. The thing about your films that are like very interesting to me is that this the the, the 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 sort of abstract digital uh, intervention that's done on the because you know our, we were talking about this earlier our our sort of like experiencing of the world is sort of like virtual and like what Stiegler says is like we got a cinematic consciousness right so we wake up into this film which is reality and I love how your work sort of like breaks that down and brings about like things that makes you realize that this you know what I mean like it, it kind of like intervenes. In a in a sort of like truth to the medium Brechtian way with like how actually f this is actually just a virtual thing and how sort of like is the extension of the the subtitle so they're kind of like visual subtitle that kind of like take over the surface of the film because if the subtitle is always down there the subtitle kind of does that but you guys kind of exaggerate that and kind of like visualize it and it kind of takes over and that's to me is like one of the significant contributions you guys have made to cinema mm -hmm. so. So um, I'm also very grateful that you bring up another um, uh, point of view of technology. To me, it's uh, really important to to turn the question of these uh, of these outer technologies toward inner technologies and uh, the technologies of our body and the ways we perceive things. So, which means really to work on our nervous systems and endocrine systems, and through uh, how much time we um, offer ourselves to be in contact to an image that demands a space of silence, of stillness, um, of uh, really uh, coming back of a, on a way of resisting that makes us learn that there is so much technology in ourselves that has not been developed, explored at all. So it's through this exposure of long-term images and um, ways of relating to to that outer technology that can bring us back to our own technology. That's what I really uh, love about your work. So thank you. It's, it's more a comment than a question. Um, hello. Th thanks for your presentation. Going back to um, Tchaikovsky and the ending of the film, and this, uh, um, this huge decision on changing um, regarding um, um, changing the ending from the uh, what Tarkovsky had planned from um, from the shooting script mm -hmm. to to what we we get at the end this 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 poem that ends with this image of desire as being something really somber, something yeah. dark, something probably yeah. I impenetrable. Whereas the uh, what the shooting script gives you is basically a celebration of desire in itself. So many things, sweet things, tactile things. It's joyful, so it's a completely it's a, it's a huge change in mood that also I believe changes the politics of the film, because if uh, if you try triangulate this with the ending of the uh, Strugatsky's uh, roadside picnic, which is basically th the whole novel is about desire, about this room where you can get what your your um, your heart's true desire, which is the thing. What do you really want? That's the key thing. And and in at the end of the novel, what we get is this this guy, the stalker, uh, getting to the room and and basically saying to this unknown entity, okay, now since you're so powerful, you just do the guessing, you just guess what I want, you do the work. I cannot decide for my own desire, but basically he ends up shouting, uh, I want happiness for everybody, no conditions, and no one left behind which is the most utopian expression of desire that you can get, which is collective and extremely political. And that sort of gets excised in stages, I believe, in, in uh, Tarkovsky's version of the story. Okay, there the celebration of desire is excised, and then you get also the collective dimension, the dimension of hope is excised, and you end up with a not exactly a dystopian, vision in the sense in which we understand it today, but uh, it's proto-dystopian, 
which explains mm. why it lends itself, I believe, I I to, to be reinterpreted and revisualized and reimagined in those terms uh, no. in today. Would you agree with that? I have a response to that, by the way, but let's wait. Let's. Uh... Okay. Uh, why not? Yeah, I, I do want to respond because it was a question about Tarkovsky, and that's our favorite subject. Uh, so, uh, like, uh, so there is there is another film, the first real well-known film by Tarkovsky, Ivan's Childhood, in which uh, Tarkovsky reinterpreted a novel about a child, a uh, twelve-year-old who lived during the Great Patriotic War, and um, this child is like a hero, and he's not really a fight. It's not a war movie, but it's set in the war, and uh, Tarkovsky much. To the, to the dismay of the writer of the original novel and script, added a, a few dreams of Ivan to the script, to the, to the script, in which Ivan would dream of the childhood that he never had, a normal childhood, you know, with his mother, etc. And these these dreams interfere in the film in a really striking way, and they completely turn around what the film is about. And I, for me, that that whole bit about uh, about the chocolates and the things that uh, the child wants, you know, the, uh, are a little bit like that normal child. They're like a normal childhood, and I think he maybe realized later. I don't know. Like we will never know, but that that this was not what this this child really thought or was about, or this was not really, uh, uh, you know, in line with what this film would be. So it would really worked that Ivan dreamt of just. You know, his uh, playing on the beach, etc. Things he never could do because he was he was born in the war. Uh, but um, uh, Monkey in, in Stalker has a quite a different uh, view, as we saw. So I think it is a sort of Ivan's childhood-like move that he moved. He actually moved away from that. Uh, yeah. And other than that, I agree with your with your comment. And also, I, I'm not in favor of the word dystopian. Uh, it's just a black box. Of the work, it's not the actual work. It's the, what people think that the work is. Okay. okay. Bueno, <coughs> hay un artificio que el que el cine digital roba del cine clásico para trasvestirlo. There's an artifact. There's um, a device that. Um, ¿Has dicho algo otra vez? Sí. The digital <laughs> cinema. ¿Quieres traducirle tú, José? Mejor. Lo <laughs> I knew this w would eventually happen. Okay. All right. Go slow, please. Okay. Okay. Existe un, un artificio del cine digital que que roba del cine clásico para trasvestirse. Um, there's this uh, there's this device, the digital cinema, is basically stealing from classical cinema in, in order to to uh, um, cross dress itself, cross disguise itself. Conceptos como tiempo, duración, espera, timeline, cámara, movimiento son conceptos del cine clásico. All these concepts, um, timeline, duration, time itself, cámara, uh, camera movements, they, they come from, from uh, basically from classical uh, cinema. So, uh, se puede hablar realmente de una especificidad, especificidad del cine digital más allá del, del formato de, de lo digital. Y de lo que esto abraza. So b b beyond the the the, um, the dimension of, of the digital format itself, is there anything specific? Would there be anything specific that distinguishes uh, uh, digital cinema in cinematic terms? For sure, for sure. Like I, I really, uh, this is another thing that I didn't have time to go into because it's something that that's very much of interest, but we're not interested necessarily in interfaces for cinema. We're interested in cinema for the interface. Meaning that Netflix, that's interface for cinema. And we're talking about something else. So we're talking about, really practically speaking, just the fact that you have that cinema as a art form, you know, or as a doctrine, I would rather call it, presupposes semi-ideal conditions of a darkened room where you watch for one and a half hours altogether in a room with nothing else happening. You watch a narrative. 
And of course, in a digital sort of digital circumstances, the the the, the, the conditions of watching already are completely different. Like uh, one thing that we struggled with 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 information skies which was initially released online was that some of the shots were so dark that you could really not see anything on a laptop screen during the daytime so i think that for example um the assumptions that we have about uh or the very reality that we can have about people watching on digital platforms has a way of currently of conditioning image in certain ways in a different direction than cinema would go it conditions uh images on a legibility that corresponds to average conditions. The fact that we watch alone, that we no longer watch collectively, but we watch stuff alone, but in a different sense than we watch television alone, because we can, or we think we can control the timeline, and there is constant distraction. So the way in which um, the digital image has to either incorporate or fight against its own distraction, those things are, uh, are, 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 have really changed. And a lot of, a lot of um, cinema doctrine, what you call classical cinema, is actually assumptions about what viewers will think when they see something. It's a lot of assumptions about the viewer. So rather than a doctrine of making, it's a doctrine of watching that's, that's encased in this, in this kind of uh, classical cinema paradigms. Um, and uh, obviously someone like Tarkovsky, but a whole bunch of other uh, filmmakers are challenging those rules from cinema, but, but platform, but the digital condition or digital, the digital layer in cinema can, can challenge kind of a lot more there. And the film world is very slow in adapting to these, uh, to these changes, but they will definitely uh, happen. So, so in our in one way of seeing this, you know, the, 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 the fact that um, the technology to produce cinema has been semi-democratized, uh, it's meaning that it's now punk, punk technology that you can use to create sort of pseudo cinema, uh, eats away the edges of what the discipline is and it will definitely affect uh, in the long run how, how we watch cinema with a big C, in my view. Daniel, uh, we're out of time. Thank you so much yeah, for joining yeah. us. Say hello to Vinka, and it was very nice to have you. Thank you so much for attention, for the opportunity. So sorry that we're not there in person, but it sounds, it looks like a really super nice gathering and wish you um, success and strength and everything. <laughs> Thank you so much. Okay. Take care. Bye-bye.